music is a message, you know, music is uh, like the speech of all angels, let's say. No matter where you're from in the world, no matter what language you speak, you can always hum or sing your favorite song. There's just something very special about dancing in the sun or dancing under the stars. I mean, it's just a little more magical. And if, you, if it's a DJ who knows how to capture that and sew that into their sets, then you have something really magical. Experiencing music together, you know, like that's just a basic human need, I think. When people get together and they experience it en masse and they have these incredible moments, it is like a really powerful thing. Music creates memories, it, it puts you in a place and a time, but a festival can do that with music. You know, and it can really like centre you in that moment and you can kind of take with you for the rest of your life. Festivals have just become extremely popular. It's gone mental, you know. There's an increased risk when anything becomes more popular. I think people are definitely more demanding in what they expect. It's clearly not just about music. It's about the whole entertainment. It's about the experience when you walk through that gate. Festivals increasingly are the lifeblood of how bands, artists, DJs, musicians get started. There's only so many people to go around, there's only so many DJs, artists, acts to go around, so there has to be a cut-off point at some point. I, th I think we've reached Pinnacle. festivals <laughs> I do love festivals it's a gathering of like-minded people well, even if you're not like-minded you're there for the same reasons you know my most favorite early memories of being a, like a teenager is going to festivals yeah yeah all your best mates there it's a real event you save up for a long time to go together you wear crazy clothes put funny makeup on there's a certain energy and a certain like peacefulness about everyone coming together and being in one place and experiencing lots of different strange and possibly sometimes eerie and maybe even unsettling things that feeling of collective experience and coming away and, and going wow we all just did that together and and and, uh, and it was almost like a journey a general desire to go out in the country in, in the summertime and sit in the sun and, uh, uh, and play music. I mean, that makes sense, doesn't it? A mí me gusta ver cómo la gente, cómo los jóvenes usan la música, cómo los hace más felices, cómo los revoluciona, cómo, cómo hace que interactúen unos con otros, ¿no? cómo es un vínculo de, de crear relaciones afectuosas de amistad entre ellos. ¿no? Es un instrumento para realmente, es un instrumento la música en sí mismo para crear este tipo de relación. ¿no? In just one of the many, just fucking rolling around, doing stupid shit, going seeing stupid stuff, is kind of what festivals are about, isn't it? It's kind of like everyone's there together, all different walks of life, all different mindsets. Some people are into rock music, some people are into folk music, but they're all there, all together, having a lovely time. Festivals have just become extremely popular. Certainly since we started out, it's gone mental. I think just a consensus of industry and public that it's something everybody wants. Artists want to play them, managers want to do them, the public want to go to them. There's demand and there's supply. We've got three million people now that, that are um, registered and pre-registered. Three million, that's 5% of the entire UK population. Oh, surely they want to come, oh, but they can't all come because there's only room for 200,000 or so. In it. There's a an increased risk when anything becomes more popular. Like any, you know, we started out as promoters in club nights, and you know, the, the party started as our friends and just our friends, and then our friends' friends came and their friends came, and obviously after about a couple of years, you realise you don't recognise anyone in the crowd anymore. There's a risk of popularity maybe bringing 
not undesirables or maybe people that aren't don't fit in with the ethos of what you've tried to start. Now the, the trick is to keep the party feeling as good as when you first started it. For the first year we was like maybe 500 friends, 600 friends partying. And obviously now because, because we became like an international or global brand, uh, there is people flying from all over the world and people understand the brand, some others don't know. So we have to teach them how to do it. I think festivals have risen so much in popularity because they offer such a wide experience to people. You know, if you think for the same price as going to a headline show like Foo Fighters or something, that could be a couple of hundred pounds. Whereas at a festival for less than that, you can experience loads of different genres, you know, loads of different food, you know, so much more going on. Yeah. I think it's an explosion of music that is coupled with culture. Yeah. And I love it that you you get the unexpected because you're there, you see so many different artists. Yeah. So it's a win-win. And they've definitely become into the more mainstream now, like going to a festival is like, you know, going on holiday, going for a weekend break, or even like going to the pub. It's just something everyone does every year now. There was a time when you never mentioned at work that you worked at a festival or you went to a festival because People always looked at the, the negative side of it, didn't they? They always saw it, they always kind of thought that, oh, you're into drugs and you're into getting drunk all weekend. And it wasn't really about that. And I think what's happened now is that festivals have become quite middle class because to go to a festival is kind of respected now. It's not, it's not frowned upon as it used to be maybe 10, 12, 15 years ago. And we still get a lot of British people come and park outside and, and they, uh, they go glamping, you know. And suddenly we got Lamborghinis next door. I, I, I mean, loads of them. And what are they doing here, you know? It's not odd. I think people are definitely more demanding in what they expect, particularly at festivals where they, they want all the variety of organic or vegan food, they want nice toilets, you know, they want all these kind of uh, facilities. They are demanding from the promoter to be more creative. So, you know, like before, it was easier. For the last 15, 20 years, it's all about opening places, booking DJs and making money. Now, these times are over. So, I really believe that if a promoter don't, don't do something different um, they want less yeah I think effort the festivals that make effort to make it different to, to look we can all just go and chuck a load of tents in a field and put DJ XYZ on and, and have a lovely time they're the ones that sort of fail or the ones where there's no effort made entonces para mí es importantísimo saber saber primero entender a tu cliente qué, qué público tienes que quieren y después hacer un poco la producción a, a su nivel, ¿no? pero no dependiendo del dinero ni de, la, ni de las cuestiones técnicas, sino del sentimiento, del concepto, del, del valor que tiene eso, ¿no? del, de lo intangible, de lo que de lo que no puedes comprar. You have to add some extra value to the to the party other than just the venue and the and the music. So whether it's decoration, whether it's confetti, whether it's balloons or whether it's fancy dress, whatever it is, or you know, you have to add something extra. Like festivals probably have the bigger budget to do. Uh, to the big uh, productions, but it's, you know, it adds to the experience. We take over about nine trucks from the UK. We build stages on the mountains, we build stages in forests, we, we do street party stages. We take over about 350 production people, including stewards, builders, chippies, custom service staff, and then we have to decamp them into a, into a foreign country. At the same time we're doing that, we are bringing in thousands and thousands of people through our own tour operator system. Then we're building and bringing all the artists and the sponsors and the press and we have to deliver about 10 shows a night, about 15 shows in the daytime. It could be a different pop-up, it could be 200 people here. With an umpire band coming in to play on the bottom of the ski lift, at the same time we could be doing 5,000 people in the forest. We pretty much invest all of our money back into our show. I mean, like, we could have just done the DJ thing and had like a couple of vocalists, but we put 15 people on stage and then we're like, wow, this is sick. Like, if you include technicians and lighting and sound, you've got 20-man crew, 25-man crew. You fly that to Australia, 
You're spending 200 grand on, on just getting there. Yeah, you know you're talking, I mean? And it's like. It was 26, I think. 26 hotel rooms, 26 like, flights. It's yeah. mad. When you get into that level, you really need to be playing big venues and doing and getting paid uh, a, a decent way just to cover your costs. I've seen stage design becoming far more important now. For us, in order to headline a main, you know, a main stage, we, you know, we prefer to have a kind of a big, a big, some sort of show, light show, some sort of screens. You've got this incredible blank canvas of a field, and you can project. And now, with all of the incredible stuff you can do, you know, all the mapping, and you know, people are so ambitious with their productions now. We use a lot of lights and video and stuff in our show, a lot of production, so it's really nice because then the whole thing just gets more and more intense, you know, as the music does and it just turns into, you know, the dark side. With the rise of some of the festivals like Tomorrowland and Mysteryland, you know, they are more of a spectacle, so fans see lots of explosions and lights and stage design. I think it all is bonuses and pluses to the experience. Mm. I love it. I love it when you see the CO2 and, you know, the confetti yeah. and, and the lights. I love yeah. that, you know, because I see the reaction. It really does, no matter what, if you pump that CO2, they're gonna go, whoa! Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it's cool, it's really cool. I think sometimes that can take away from the actual artist and the music, because when you're standing right at the back, you can't actually see the crazy stuff actually going on on stage, and you can't even see the DJ. We spend a lot of time working with artists for our visuals, mm -hmm. and we're so happy with the current ones that we've got. They're really wacky and wonderful, but we, we did notice when yes. we brought them to the bigger stages, they didn't seem to translate quite as well. No. You know, because these stages are so complicated, they have the centre and then they've got the side panels mm. often. So you, you often need to get graphics made just for venues. Our way of production is a little different than other festivals. Uh, we don't put up big stages with, you know, big LED walls. Our vibe is, you know, nature. Uh, a lot of the production that we do, uh, you know, the staging is all done in bamboo, even at the beach. We don't want anything too invasive. Everything we, the backdrop of what we're offering is, is the beauty of it. And you put some lights and great sound system and great artists and a bunch of happy people. I mean, you're in heaven. The connection with the crowd at a festival, if it's not done right, you could, you're, sometimes you're so far away you can feel disconnected. But I also think that if, if it's, the best connections you have when you're DJing, I feel, are at festivals, if, if it's the right setup. You've got to give everyone, the crowd, the ravers, the artists, to have the best opportunity to have the most fun possible. And if you, do, if you get it wrong, it can be awful at a festival. But if you get it right, there's no better place. Also what's great about at festivals has been our experience, as the fans really the, the dedicated fans come for you. Mm. So you, you see you see the ones that are there for you. You know, they have the nervous Same flags. flags. Yeah. So it's really, um, it's beautiful. You can see them in the, yeah. you can point them out and I just love it. Definitely, you just have moments where you're looking out over the crowd and it's like, this is great. Yeah. This is really, this makes it all worthwhile. I think 1994 was Orbital when they headlined, which was like a really seminal moment for everybody. It was amazing. And we got asked to do it at the last minute. And then, so we went, yeah, why not? Great. And then at that point, we said, well, what are we going to do? You know, we'd, we'd be playing in daylight. So our agent said to um, Bjork, you know, could we swap? Could they play last? Because they, they've got this big production. And she went, yeah, sure. So we played that and there was a lot of resistance to prove that a couple of people on stage twiddling knobs and pushing buttons can actually carry an audience. At Glastonbury at the time, people go off and they would find your little places dotted around playing techno or, or electronic music secretly, you know, but there was no main acts or anything. So um, no. they were just gagging for it, really gagging for like absolutely full that field, ele electronic it? sound. And it was just like, boom, Glastonbury is one of the sort of, you know, huge, huge yardsticks and, you know, great business model and everything, do you know what I mean, of how to do a festival. It was the beginning of Glastonbury's love affair with all things electronic, which today is vast. I mean, Glastonbury is big enough and unique enough that some of the spontaneity that goes with electronic culture can happen there. 
at a glassery, me and Norman, Fatboy Slim, we did a back-to-back uh, -back and all those people in that tent, they'd come to watch me, they hadn't come to watch Fatboy Slim. They get there like, who's that? Is that? Yeah, it is. And uh, you know what? It was absolutely brilliant. I was obviously really excited about it, but sort of dubious because he can play stuff that's a little rambunctious, shall we say. There's a chance it could have been bad, but it worked absolutely brilliantly. Festivals increasingly are the sort of the lifeblood of how bands, artists, DJs, musicians get started. Um, it's harder and harder to do your own shows. Um, festivals tend to be well monetized, they give you a platform, they plug you into all kinds of media and, and exposure that you wouldn't necessarily have. Or even if you've already built your own community and you want to kind of go wider, Playing the right festivals can very much trigger opening you up to a wider audience. Festivals are massively important to us in terms of breaking rudimental fruit. You know, the key difference with us is that we took the electronic music experience and played it live. There was loads of people on stage and we brought the whole thing to life, you know, and that became our calling card really. So for us, we kind of came through at the cusp of the revival of festivals. Yeah, it, must, it was integral to our, our success, I think, our, like our live show. We just literally did every single festival we could. We said yes to everything, and that really helped us grow our live show, become better musicians, better performers, and I think it got us a lot of fans. Play at, you your preaching to the non-converted, so you're, you're playing to people who just come up, they're, just, they're at the festival, they think, oh, I'll go and check them out. They're, you know, playing, great. And you might win people over. You give people something new to experience. You get to play to massive crowds, crowds that I never, ever thought, never, ever dreamed I would play to. I mean, 18, 19,000 people. It's the smaller areas that feature the new music. So in Silver Haze, Block 9, Unfair Ground, you know, the common. If you look at, if you look at the lineup, there's over 3,000 acts that play uh, within the festival. So the, the satellite stages, as we call them, are very much responsible for driving the, the, the new music. They're kind of the step, in, step into, the, into the festival. I love it how at festivals there are stages where there are, you know, a lot of um, up and coming artists. Yes. And um, I definitely remember when we were more up and coming. Yeah. And you'd be on the side stage and um, you'd be doing what you do. And I, I just, I love the freedom that brings to those artists. When you, when you reach the main stage, there's more of an obligation to play a certain way, you know, to be a little bit more of that crowd pleaser. And so in a way you're, um, be less, you know, it's a little bit less creative. Oh, one bad thing about festivals that you're not going to get at clubs is if you're not playing in a tent and the weather's bad, yeah. then it's a bit of a drainer. The thing about rain is, you, ca you know, you can't sit down on the floor. You've got to find a chair. That's, a, you know, you, the backs of your legs end up killing you by the end of a festival because, you know, you're just pulling all that extra weight of mud around. There's a Dunkirk mentality about Glastonbury Festival because more times it rains and it's muddy than it is sunny and hot and the atmosphere when it's raining and muddy is just as good as the atmosphere when it's hot and sunny. We got to play the pyramid stage the year after the second time we played Glastonbury yeah. and that was we were so excited but about three or four songs through the set there was lightning strike like right near the stage and we didn't know what was going on. They just told us we all had our in-ears on, we were in the music and they told us you got to get off and they cut the music off and we were getting pissed off. And yeah, like, you, can hear Leo, you can hear Locksmith on the mic like yeah. <laughs> on YouTube. Like, you I'm going to go out, our, our stage manager and like, what the, f you know, we're not getting off. When you're, you've built yourself up to a show yeah, and it's invested everything, so much time you and money your blood, sweat, everything. People, you know, a lot of artists have put their, year, their life into this. It does hurt. And sometimes it's not humans, sometimes it's literally like technology just goes, I'm gonna just shut down. Or, mm. or water gets into a tiny bit of the amp. Oh, okay. we had a funny time. It was um, at Tomorrowland in Brazil. We were having the best time. Like it was just one of those sets where everything flowed. It felt great. It felt great. Yeah. And um, there's the right amount of nerves. 
Mm -hmm. So you're you're excited, but you're not cheating yourself. <laughs> but then the last song, right just before the, the last drop, drop um, like it's building, it's building, it's building, and then someone throws a t-shirt, a wet t-shirt in the a crowd. ball. Yeah, in a ball. Yeah, it hits the CDJ on the pause button. Yeah. Can you believe and it? And we're going like this and yeah. suddenly this t-shirt comes flying it was, and the music stops. It was a miracle also because the CDJs had a barrier over them. Yeah. It's like, this guy should go and play baseball or some <laughs> ball sport because it was an amazing aim. I don't think people talk enough about the economic benefits of festivals. They, they talk a lot about the problems that festivals can bring sometimes. Um, and those problems are real and most festival promoters liaise with local authorities and police and so on to try and navigate that. It's without question that there's an, a generally an economic upside to having a successful festival in your area. I mean, it's definitely enriched the, the community. You have 70,000 people all taking taxis, uh, renting uh, hotels or condos, uh, having dinners. Uh, you know, going out drinking, uh, and uh, that's a big boost to the economy. I think ADE brings about 60 million uh, extra income to the city, but the, uh, the promotion value is even much bigger. The council, the tourist board, the mayor of Meinhofen embrace it, they love it. We bring a, a lot of business to, to the town in the shoulder part of the season. And what happens is the people in the town come to life for that week as well. So it's for the people in my firm, it's their best week of the season because they're, they're invaded by uh, by thousands of really up for it, happy, friendly uh, uh, young, youngsters, 25 to 35 year old people. Uh, all the kids in the resort, you know, all the youth, like 16 plus, they're excited because the resort comes alive. So we have a really close relationship with the local community. Um, and we have three NGOs that we work with. So we've been able to fund certain projects all over the world. So you can kind of, you can build a bit of a relationship with the people on the ground there. And that, for me, like that's the stuff that's really interesting about the festival, being able to have a platform which we can use to donate money and to, uh, you know, help other people. Greenpeace get half a million pounds a year every year. And so do Oxfam and, and WaterAid get a lot of money as well. So there is a burning mission there by improving the quality of life on Earth and everything. People are travelling further afield to go to festivals, so they don't just try and do it on the doorstep. They'll do it outside of the UK as well. A festival in Europe is probably going to be cheaper, warmer, drier, you know, nicer to go to than some of the festivals in, in, in England. You can go to Exit Festival, 99 euros, right? When you get there, it's like 250 a pint, and you've got a huge lineup, and you're experiencing something different, and you're also mixing it with your summer holiday, and it doesn't rain. At ADE, you, you see people from all over the world coming over. So there's a delegation with 50 people from China in one plane, and delegation from India, from Mexico, from all over the world. and. and it, uh, that's so great about the, this music. It's really connecting people from all, all over the world. I guess the growth of Croatia and the scene there is a bit of a phenomenon, you know. Um, who'd have thought that would have happened, you know, in my early days of my career? I mean, it's amazing how many events, clubs, festivals and things that are going on there. Croatia now is one of the five most popular destinations in the world. And before the Tistan was, as all Dalmatian, small islands, small cities, was the place for a family vacation, family destinations. And in that question, Tistan has changed. Festival tourism are something new. Our local people are accepted this festival very good because the uh, habits of the family guests are not mixed with the habits of the party guests and people who come into festival. The fact that you're in this mad little village in the middle of Croatia and it's just a beautiful place and because of that the atmosphere and the vibe and the, the way people behave because you're in this amazing idyllic place it just changes things you know what I mean so and that it's effort to put that on. There's so many great settings to dance so you can be dancing on a boat for four hours and then you can come back in and dance underneath the olive grove then you can go over to the beach bar and you're just looking at the coastline here and it it, it, it massively amplifies whatever you're feeling that music 
in the trees, looking out onto the beach in this beautiful country is kind of what makes it. That wouldn't work if you're doing it in Grimsby on a Wednesday in the dark, you know what I mean? Um, at the back of a fish and chip shop. Fish and chip, I like fish and chips. The important aspect of the festival is still the music, you know, and maybe what the festival stands for, its ethos, because a lot of people tend to go to events now that resonates with something they believe in. Internally, we try to ban the word festival because we just think it's a gathering and a celebration of life. Most festivals you go to, I think, are pretty one-dimensional. You go, you go listen to music and you come out. Here, we're just, we're trying to create what you would actually do in the course of your lifetime that you would love, but encapsulate it in a day. We want to have a good time, but we also want to have meaning. We want to have meaning in our lives, and we want to be mindful. So when I think about it, what we aspire to do is have mindful entertainment, meaningful fun. Plus Village is not just a music festival. It is an immersive sort of like theater experience. The idea was it's like being in, in a, inside a, a film, sort of like a Spielberg meets Stephen King kind of scenario. I know from, from my own experience, I don't want to just go and, and, and not necessarily listen to music for three days straight. It's a really strong part of, of what it's, what's important, but it's also about stimulating all those different other areas that people demand. You know, we want, we want people to be able to feel comfortable to go and do, you know, yoga or some of like holistic treatments on like a Saturday morning, you know, you don't have to go and spend the night in a field or in the woods or wherever. You know, there's lots of other things you can do and, and places to hang out. You can go and paint and you can go and like sit in an oxygen tank with your head, your head in an oxygen tank and you can do all this crazy stuff. And I think that uh, diversity in approach and also, as I say, making an effort. Blue Dot one was like, had seminars during the day, all science orientated, you know, we had the, the Joddle Bank telescope. It's clearly not just about music. Um, it's, it's about the whole entertainment, it's about the experience when you walk through that gate. I mean, I always thought of having a, a festival where you, you walk along a pier, you know, to get into the festival with all your stuff and then you go down a huge slide, you know, and, and that's your entry into the festival. So I think people want a sense of, of adventure and utopia. You need to find unusual locations, you need to give them a little bit more than just your, you, you know, your box standard festival with a few tents and a, a, a few stall holders. Are there too many festivals? I mean, I don't think you could ever have too much music, to be honest. In Holland, they have like 360 odd festivals, music festivals a year. They're pretty much all packed. Only in Amsterdam during the summer, we have 150 festivals. It's unbelievable. And Amsterdam is not that, that big. I mean, they all seem to be surviving at the moment. You know, lots of them have something different to offer. I think maybe festivals that all have the same lineup might suffer. If people start to perceive that it doesn't matter where they go in the world, the lineups are more or less the same, the danger is that people tire of uh, the idea of going to a festival, that it becomes predictable. There's only so many DJs, artists, acts to go around, so there has to be a cut-off point at some point. I, th I think we've reached Pinnacle. I don't think you can have any more. And if, if there were less, I don't think it'd be a bad thing. You know, festivals have a bright future. I think. I don't think that it's going to die. I think that, I think that the commercial pop music may slow down a little. Techno is like the classical music of this era. It's not gonna go out of style. We have longevity. I don't, know. I don't see any reason for them to stop. They seem to diversify, they seem to be growing in numbers. There's small ones, there's big ones. People want to experience music. You know, human beings are, you know, social creatures, you know, we like mixing with people, having fun, um, traveling to new places, you know, we're inquisitive, we want to do these things. So I think they're going to continue to grow. You go to work nine to five, you do what you have to do, and then the weekend's yours to go and party, let loose, and forget about all the drudgery of day-to-day -day life. And that is, that's the same as it is, it's always going to be the same, you know. At the end of the day, ravers are going to rave. My grandfather and my father always tell me, people are going to keep on dancing and, and they are going to keep on partying. That will never end.
Y quizás lo, lo más bonito de, de este negocio es ver a la gente ser feliz, ¿no? Porque es muy difícil que nadie baile cuando está triste. ¿no? Eso es importante. Que la gente sonría. I think we just need to keep evolving and kind of always trying to change it and kind of, you know, tweak it and make it better. Long may it continue, eh? Long may it continue. Another 10 years, maybe? What do you think? I think we have a really powerful live music scene in this country and it's to be cherished as part of our heritage here, so I hope it continues for a long, long time. You know, the world is a very complicated place right now and the electronic community is one place for sure where you can walk on a dance floor and none of that matters. And I think at the end of the day, we probably could use as much of that as possible right now. I think that without festivals, I think the world would be a much duller place. <laughs>